racism and discrimination in the European Union at times of COVID-19, the role of fundamental rights uh, monitoring. Um, I'm Sergio Carrera. I'm Senior Research Fellow at CEPS, and I will be chairing uh, today's webinar. Um, first, uh, this event is co-organized between CEPS and the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency, the FRA. And I would like to thank the FRA, and in particular, Director Michael O'Flaherty and his team for this uh, cooperation and opportunity. Uh, it is a timely moment because the FRA is, has been publishing a number of bulletins um, on uh, fundamental rights impacts uh, of COVID-19. And they have just published uh, recently the third bulletin, uh, paying particular attention to older people. And we thought this was a very good moment uh, to take stock of everything that has been happening during the last weeks and reflect together on how the pandemic, COVID-19, is demonstrating that it has affected more, let's say, some groups. It has affected people not equally. It has affected more some people and some groups. It has also illustrated and even exacerbated all the patterns of discrimination, racism and xenophobia, not only in the US, but also in Europe. These are current and they have been very pertinent issues and problematic issues in Europe as well. Now, the death of George Floyd, the 25th of May, while in police custody, uh, it unraveled uh, major protests and demonstrations, not only in the US, but also the Black, Black Lives Matter uh, movements across the world. We've seen demonstrations all over the world, also in Europe. And if anything positive out of these demonstrations is that they have brought light of all our co concern, that we are all concerned about systematic and institutionalized manifestations of racism and discrimination, particularly those affecting black people and people of color and in all areas of life. It has also brought light to things that we need to speak about more clearly, more in the open, injustices, crimes against humanity, also in Europe, Europe's colonial past, and Europe's role as well in its transatlantic slave trade, but also persecution of groups, specific groups and minorities in Europe. The Roma community is only one example, but also now refugees and migrants. So we are witnessing a number of historically embedded discriminations, which reflect on our educational systems in the labor market but even the people who represent us or who work in the administrations at the national level, also European level, we are based in Brussels, also European institutions face this problem uh, of diversity, reflecting the actual diversities that are characterizing our societies. Now we've seen in COVID-19, some of those issues and challenges have been exacerbated, but also um, uh, let's say taken different um, manifestations. We see examples of police checks, of police profiling, increasing barriers on access to justice and remedies by victims of human rights violations. And if anything, this brings us back to the core principles of the European Union and its member states, the rule of law and fundamental rights safeguards for all, um, the importance to uphold and to better safeguard those principles, and the key role that the European Union can play in making a difference in the actual delivery to people of these values that are laid down in the treaties so that they become a reality for everyone. The goal of this webinar is really to discuss the significance of COVID-19 on individuals' uh, fundamental rights, but also the potential role and necessity to have better fundamental rights monitoring um, in the European Union. Now, very briefly, the rules of procedure for today's webinar. So we have about one hour and a half, one hour and 15 minutes. We will start with a keynote speech by Commissioner for Equality, Elena Dali. We are delighted to have Commissioner Dali with us. Um, and we are very grateful that she's joining this discussion. And this will be followed by the presentation by the FRA director, Michael O'Flaherty, who will also lay down the work, the excellent work of the FRA in highlighting 
these questions based on research. Then we are delighted to have with us member of the European Parliament, Pierrette Hersberger Fofana. Um, she will be addressing her speech in French and I will do my best to also liaise later on in the Q&A um, the English questions, translating them into French. Next, we have a representative of civil society, the European Network Against Racism, NR, uh, chair of the board of NR, Karen Taylor. We are super, really happy to have NR as is one of the key actors, uh, umbrella organization, working on racism and discrimination for a long time. And last, we have an academic, uh, a member of the scientific committee of the FRA and a professor on European law who has long-standing expertise uh, on questions of uh, equality and non-discrimination, Professor Dora Kostakopoulou. So this is the panel. Um, we have the possibility for you, uh, for the participants, to pose questions to the panel. Please use the Q&A option in Zoom. Write one question, identify yourself as well. Seb's team will be selecting those questions and I will be posting them back to the panel. So this is in short the introduction. I'm now happy to give the floor to Commissioner Daly. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for asking me to uh, speak at this, at this um, seminar. Um, especially uh, that we are um, now celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Racial Equality Directive. And this directive established a framework to fight racial and ethnic discrimination and has considerably advanced equality in Europe. Not only did its adoption lead to important national legislative changes, it has also paved the way for groundbreaking institutional reforms, including the setting up of national equality bodies who are doing essential work. On paper, and I stress on paper, the Racial Equality Directive is a powerful tool to tackle discrimination based on ethnic or racial origin. The same goes for the Commission's recommendation on standards for equality bodies adopted in 2018, which aims to support the work of equality bodies. But while we may have made legislative progress, racism and discrimination remain very much alive in the European Union and the current health pandemic has underlined this. The 2019 Eurobarometer on discrimination in the EU published by the Commission shows that almost six in 10 Europeans think discrimination based on ethnic origin and particularly against Roma is widespread in their country. Recent data collected by European Union's Fundamental Rights, Rights Agency shows that one in three black people in the EU has experienced, experienced harassment. Therefore, as we celebrate 20 years of the Racial Equality Directive, it is amply clear that structural problems still very much exist in the EU. And there is a wide gap between having the legislation in place and the impact it has on people's lives. Legislation is only as good as the impact, as the effect it has on improving people's lives. What I want the Commission to focus on is what lies beneath the tip of the iceberg, the unconscious, invisible, and societally entrenched racism and discrimination. I want to thank the Fundamental Rights Agency and SEPS for this very timely discussion because it is thanks to the work carried out by the Fundamental Rights Agency and their data collection on impacts of the pandemic and fundamental rights that we can get a better understanding of the full picture and understand where there are the most dangerous risks regarding racism and discrimination. During the COVID-19 crisis, for instance, we have seen that the most vulnerable and in particular Black and brown communities have been disproportionately affected. Umbrella organizations such as ILGA Europe have been closely monitoring the impact of the pandemic on LGBTI plus communities 
and have raised a vast number of serious problems. From reduced access to health services for LGBTI communities, such as specialized health clinics being shut down or transition related surgery being canceled to LGBTI plus communities being blamed for the pandemic itself. And we have reached out to NGOs for their input here. And I want to use this opportunity to thank NR in particular for their work and cooperation. Any way in which racism and discrimination can be flagged from monitoring fundamental rights by institutions to taking the message to the streets in peaceful process, protest, is a crucial step in the fight in addressing it once and for all. This is precisely why the European Commission continues to proactively monitor the impact of emergency measures put in place over the last few months and the impact on fundamental rights in the EU. We are looking in particular at how the emergency measures are used in practice and what their impact is in particular on the rule of law on fundamental rights and on EU law. And as part of a new annual systematic check of the rule of law under the new rule of law mechanism, which my colleague uh, Commissioner Reinders is working on, we will have a new report in September this year on the state of play of the rule of law across the EU, including during the pandemic. This should help us identify where there are problems and address them with the tools we have in our rule of law toolbox. The hardest part of our work lies deep within, beneath the water, where discrimination and racism continue to fester in the union, unchecked, unaddressed, and deep rooted in our societies. On the 24th of June, the College of Commissioners held an important structured debate where we highlighted the need to build a Europe that is more equal, humane, and fair. As I mentioned at the start, we have a strong EU legal framework in place to fight racism, notably Articles 19 and 67 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, the provisions in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, in particular Articles 20 and 21, the Racial Equality Directive of 2000 and the Framework Decision on combating racism and xenophobia of 2008. And there are existing provisions to protect victims of crime, such as the Victims' Rights Directive, the work done to fight racism through several high-level working groups, the Diversity Charter Initiative, which helps the Commission in fostering diversity in the workplace by encouraging voluntary initiatives by businesses, as well as dedicated policies and programs such as the rights, equality, and citizenship program. But we need to do so much more. And the college, underlining that racism persists in Europe and beyond, agreed on the need for more concrete action. There are various ways open to the European Union to take action. We can look at ways to improve the implementation of the existing legislation, in particular as regards the Racial Equality Directive, and the framework decision on combating racism and xenophobia. This should include penalties when EU law in this area is not adhered to, just like any other area of EU law. And we can support member states in priority areas as we are through the new working group with the support of the European Union Agency for law enforcement training, bringing together national authorities and key civil society organizations to focus on hate crime training and capacity building for national law enforcement. But this of course is not enough. We have already agreed to start working on a new action plan for equality of racial and ethnic minorities in Europe for publication in September. And we recognize other areas for work, such as becoming more active in understanding and tackling the grounds of discrimination and racism including with the help of role models and mentors, working with media to avoid perpetuating negative stereotypes and biases, reaching out to cities and working with networks such as Orbect and the Covenant of Mayors, encouraging every EU member state to adopt the diversity charters and businesses to sign them, and by addressing our own shortcomings with every public institution 
should, which every public institution should be doing. We must increase diversity in the commission, be it through targeted tools to identify the origins of the shortcomings and responding to them in recruitment or in training and the workplace environment. As President von der Leyen stated, this is the beginning of the debate and we will come forward with concrete action in the autumn. At the same time, as we recognize the immense obstacles we still have to break down, we also need to call out those who are still dragging their feet when it comes to addressing racism and discrimination in Europe. The 2008 Commission proposal for the Horizontal Equal Directive is a good example of this. This proposal would fill the gap in EU equality legislation, which currently does not cover discrimination based on religion or belief, sexual orientation, age and disability outside of the area of employment and occupation. It is a failure for Europe not to have this directive in place after 12 years. I haven't given up on the current proposal and I'm closely working with the Council and upcoming presidencies to explore all possible options in order to reach an agreement. I thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Every conversation on racism and discrimination and in a union where we pride ourselves on inclusion is fundamental because we are not immune to the travesties felt in the United States. States. It is the duty of the European Commission and every member state in the union to address this and end the disproportionate suffering of so many people in our societies. I want to assure you that I will do my utmost to play my part as the Commissioner for Equality, striving to end racism and discrimination. It is reassuring to know we can count on the important work of agencies like the Fundamental Rights Agency to inform, to inform our legislative work and highlight where we need to do more. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Daly, for expressing your personal commitment to the portfolio that you have inside the Commission, highlighting also the priorities um, ahead on how to tackle with practical measures the challenges of racism and discrimination, and uh, the call for more concrete actions. I think it's very important, um, even inside uh, our European institutions. You mentioned inside the Commission the need to have more diversity um, reflected uh, as well. Thank you very much. Um, next is uh, Frau Director Michael O'Flaherty. Michael, you have the floor. Sergio, thank you very much indeed. And thanks to you and to SEPS for uh, working closely with us in preparing today's event. I'd like to begin by thanking Commissioner Daly for her words. I'd like to thank her for her uh, unstinting support to the work of the Fundamental Rights Agency. And I want to assure her of our sense in every moment of our work of the central importance of her mandate, her responsibilities uh, for, uh, for, for the European Union, above all in these extraordinary times. Uh, dear friends, the Fundamental Rights Agency, as the Commissioner has said, has for years now been closely monitoring the phenomena of discrimination and racism as they present themselves in the EU. We have both observed and reported on how the patterns have shifted and changed over time. Uh, we've drawn attention in recent years to the move of hate online. For a number of years now, we've flagged the gender dimension of hate and discrimination. Uh, every element of hatred and discrimination in Europe requires to be addressed wearing uh, spectacles that identify the gender dimension. We have seen and we have reported and analyzed on the links between discrimination and hate. For example, we demonstrated the intimate relationship between persistent cross-generation discrimination against Roma and the phenomenon of anti-gypsyism. We have drawn attention to the needs of victims and indeed to the commonplace neglect of the needs of victims in so many places. And very closely associated with that, we repeatedly warn about the grave, typically 90% uh, underreporting of incidents of hate and discrimination, or to put it another way, just one in 10 people 
bringing a complaint to the authorities. And most recently, in the context of our new, just launched last week, survey on fundamental rights, attitudes to fundamental rights in the general population, we brought that perspective to this story, the attitudes of the general population to discriminate against minorities. Now, as the commissioner has already said, uh, the COVID-19 period didn't create racism, didn't create discrimination, but has exacerbated the phenomena in many different ways. For example, it has focused patterns of hate against certain groups at different times. People perceived to be Chinese uh, back in February, uh, and in recent months, most shocking targeting with hate against groups such as Muslims, uh, Jews, and the Roma. We've also seen in the COVID context uh, how the pandemic impacts in a deeply unequal way. For example, who are the frontline workers without whom we would have no hope? They are typically uh, underpaid uh, people who come from minority groups already disadvantaged. Furthermore, we have seen how responses to COVID-19 unintentionally can impact very hard in a very difficult and challenging manner for certain groups. Uh, the example I would most, uh, most commonly give is that of Roma children who are sent home for distance learning, but who don't have access to the internet or indeed to a computer. Uh, the impact of COVID in terms of discrimination uh, will, will last for a long time. Long after a virus is found, we will continue to see COVID-19 related challenges for discriminated against groups. We're most likely entering into a period of economic recession. Recessions also do not hit equally. Uh, and both in managing recessions and in deal dealing with the enormous levels of state debt, which will confront our member states uh, in coming years, uh, there's a real risk of people being left behind and patterns of discrimination and of related hate being exacerbated. Now, as again has already been mentioned by you, Sergio, and by the commissioner, uh, this period of COVID-19 has also uh, brought us unexpected uh, opportunities. It has shone a light like never before on the patterns of inequality and of discrimination and on the need to fix our societies and to fix them quickly. I think that is the most appropriate context, at least here in Europe, to locate the street movements, uh, the Black Lives Matter and related street movements, which are not just demonstrations of indignation, but are actually triggering change by policymakers. If I may turn now briefly to those monitors, uh, Sergio, that you mentioned in your introduction and the need to strengthen monitoring capacity at the present time, I would like to flag four categories of monitor this morning, uh, or rather this afternoon, that require uh, our attention. The first is those street movements themselves. The street movements are not a phenomenon to be observed. Uh, they are a reality with which to engage. And we who are used to working in more traditional ways need to enter into dialogue and discussion. We need to find ways to partner up with street movements to bring about the necessary social change. Second, and turning to more traditional uh, uh, types of partner, uh, we need to invest uh, ever further resource and empowerment to national human rights institutions, to be leaders at the national level for the combating of discrimination and of hate. We at the Fundamental Rights Agency in September will produce a report on the a health check, if you will, on national human rights institutions within the EU. And we see that they're under pressure. Uh, and those pressure points must be addressed if they are to be allowed to fulfill the totality of their capacity in engaging on these critical issues. I would turn then for the third of my four uh, uh, um, actors to the equality bodies. And the commissioner has pretty much said it all already. Uh, we were celebrating 20 years of the existence of the equality bodies, 20 years of the racial equality directive. And we need to take this opportunity, this anniversary moment, to give better resources to equality bodies and uh, to, to, to more profoundly respect their independence and their essential role uh, and to provide them with the political support that they need to do their jobs. And the fourth and the final actor 
that I would mention today is the private sector. We've seen in recent weeks uh, really unexpected and encouraging signs. For example, the Stop Hate for Profit campaign, whereby some large multinational corporations are saying that they'll pull their advertising from certain online platforms unless those platforms police hate uh, that's to be found there. This is a very encouraging example of how the business world uh, and those of us who work in human and fundamental rights uh, can come together to achieve uh, very valuable outcomes. But let me, in my final remark, uh, turn specifically to issues of racism and discrimination with three suggestions, uh, one for law, one for policy, one for practice. First, law. I want to reiterate what the commissioner has said and insist again on the need for member states to do a better job of transposing and implementing the relevant European Union law. It has to be turned from the paper, as it was described by the commissioner, uh, into tools uh, at the national uh, and local levels. And for that, we need transposition and implementation. Second, policy. It's a remarkable fact that there are still some 10 EU member states that do not yet have in place a national anti-racism action plan. That's problematic. And so those 10 countries uh, need to look at that gap and fill it quickly. Third, practice. It's so important in this as in any other area of human rights that we who struggle against the problems, against racism and against discrimination, that we don't work for the impacted groups, but that we work with the impacted groups. We must give the victims of discrimination and of racism an honored place at our tables, in our deliberations, in the designing of our strategies, in their rollout, in their assessment and evaluation. And let me leave it there. And I would just conclude by saying that the Fundamental Rights Agency will maintain the combat of discrimination and racism at the very heart of its operations. Uh, and uh, all, all, all those participating today who care about these issues can count on us as a friend and a partner. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael, for your excellent presentation. And um, coming back to some of the issues uh, and questions that Commissioner Daly mentioned as well, the importance of enforcement of practical delivery and implementation of existing EU standards and the role of different actors there and celebrating also indeed the equality bodies, Equinet, uh, the European network of equality bodies, their role, the fundamental role and the importance of keeping their independence. Um, I'm aware that Commissioner Daly may not be staying with us during the entire event and there are, there are already a few questions that have been posed by the participants and I would like to take that opportunity, Commissioner, uh, to come back to you uh, on this. Um, one of the questions relates to the horizontal uh, non-discrimination directive that you mentioned uh, as one of your priorities. Uh, and one participant um, raises how to deal with uh, the fact that some governments may not be willing to, uh, politically speaking, uh, support that directive. Uh, this has been the case for so many years. What is in your strategy to de-block uh, and to move forward to have an advancement in the political support on that uh, initiative. The second uh, question uh, relates to what you mentioned, Commissioner Daly, on the annual reporting on the rule of law. You mentioned that this is an issue that is, that is uh, going to be uh, included, particularly uh, in light of COVID-19 measures. If you could explain a little bit more, um, the participants says that that annual report mainly focuses on the rule of law. Is that annual report also going to focus on fundamental rights? And the last question relates to educational activities. What are the educational initiatives? How to improve uh, at schools, at universities, that questions of discrimination and racism are a part of the curricula and the educational systems? Please. I, I will answer quickly these three questions, although to be answered properly, they, they require much more than a few um, minutes because I need to go into another I need to go into another meeting. So the first question was on the anti-discrimination directive. As I said in, in, in earlier, I, I am in communication with, with the member states 
who are uh, reluctant about the uh, directive. We are trying our utmost to, to convince that this is the way we should, we should go. Eventually, I mean, we need, we need unanimity. So I cannot say that that, you know, because even if there is one member state who is, which is opposing, then we have uh, a problem. And I'm not saying that it is easy. And, and the fact that the, the, the directive has, has been there for so many years proves how difficult it is. But, but uh, it will, if we don't succeed, it will not be because we have, we have not tried very hard. With regards to the uh, second question, yes, um, rule of law is, is directly tied to fundamental uh, rights. And, and yes, of course, uh, there, will, there will be in, in this uh, reporting uh, the, the fundamental rights uh, perspective also. And for the third question, So we seem to have a technical um, quest problem here. Um, we may hope <laughs> that the connection comes back at any moment. Um, just to inform all of you, and Commissioner, here you are, please. <laughs> please, you were just uh, cut when you were explaining the third question. Commissioner, just for all of you to be informed that um, after the Commissioner leaves us, we will have a member of her cabinet, uh, Presilia Empanu, who will be representing her, her team um, for the time that is still left. Um, I see that the technical problem is still ongoing, so perhaps I can just immediately move to um, our next uh, panelist. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to speak now in French. Um, alors, la, la suivante, la présentation suivante, uh, ça sera pour uh, uh, Madame Pierrette Herzberger Fofana. On est très content, membre du Parlement européen, on est très content d'avoir uh, avec nous uh, Madame Herzberger uh, pour aussi écouter ses témoignages et sa, son expérience dans le Parlement, Parlement européen dans ces sujets-là. Le Parlement européen a été très actif euh, dans ces domaines, euh, on a eu euh, l'adoption d'une proposition de résolution sur, la, sur les manifestations contre le racisme après la mort de George Floyd le 16 juin, mais aussi euh, une résolution de mai euh, 2019 sur les droits fondamentaux des personnes d'ascendance africaine. Euh, les deux, très, très, euh, deux euh, résolutions très importantes et euh, Madame euh, Pierrette, vous avez la parole. Donc, euh, merci bien. Euh, merci bien, Monsieur Carrer. Merci bien de m'avoir aussi invité à prendre la parole et merci aussi à Madame la Commissaire qui est déjà partie. Alors, les événements de ces derniers mois ont mis en évidence ce que nous savions déjà, c'est que les minorités ethniques visibles font l'objet d'une discrimination systémique disproportionnée ici, en Europe et en fait dans le monde entier. Les femmes, les personnes des minorités visibles, les migrants, les personnes handicapées ont été touchées de manière disproportionnée par la pandémie, d'autant plus que nombre d'entre eux travaillent dans les services de santé et font partie aussi des personnes les plus vulnérables. La violence, fondée donc sur le genre, a également augmenté, d'autant plus que les allocations sociales ont diminué et les communautés de minorités raciales et ethniques, ainsi que les personnes de la classe ouvrière, ont fait l'objet d'omniprésence et de violences policières au nom de l'application de mesures de confinement. Avant la pandémie, beaucoup d'entre nous ont soulevé la question du racisme structurel et de son impact sur les communautés minoritaires. En février de cette année, j'ai organisé un événement sur le féminisme intersectionnel avec la participation du cabinet de la commissaire, Madame Dali, et ENAR, le réseau européen contre le racisme, 
au cours duquel nous avons donc analysé l'impact des discriminations multiples sur les femmes des minorités visibles et les manières dont nous pouvons, au niveau européen, faire face à ce phénomène. Ça a été donc l'aboutissement de cette fameuse résolution. J'étais donc aussi euh, très heureuse de constater que euh, dans la stratégie pour l'égalité des sexes euh, qui a été récemment publiée par la Commission, l'intersectionnalité est mentionnée. Et enfin, je me réjouis aussi de collaborer avec la commissaire sur le prochain plan d'action sur la racisme et l'afrophobie. La reconnaissance du racisme institutionnel en Europe et l'élaboration d'un plan d'action constitue une première étape, car il y a déjà un bon cadre juridique, mais il faut surtout qu'on le mette en œuvre et il faut qu'on le réalise. Il y a un certain nombre de mesures que nous devons prendre si nous voulons vraiment affronter le problème du racisme systémique au sein de la société européenne. La collecte des données ventilées par origine raciale et ou ethnique devrait être systématique et obligatoire. Les chiffres sont fondamentaux dans nos efforts afin de montrer les effets du racisme dans notre société. Le rapport, par exemple, « Being Black in Europe » est un bon exemple du type de collecte de données systématiques dont nous avons besoin. Grâce à ce rapport, nous disposons actuellement d'une base quantitative sur laquelle nous pouvons fonder notre travail, mais elle n'est pas suffisante. Il en est de même de l'enquête online qui va être faite bientôt par Afrocensus, qui, a lieu, qui va avoir bientôt dans notre État membre en Allemagne, donc sous l'égide de e auto Ceci pourrait aussi donc inciter tous les États membres à collecter également des données dans leur pays et à les publier afin qu'il soit possible d'obtenir des statistiques réelles en ce qui concerne la discrimination. En plus, il est urgent de s'attaquer à la question des violences policières dans les États membres et de travailler à la responsabilisation, à la justice, à la prévention et à la présence de la policière excessive, en particulier au sein des communautés ethniques minoritaires. La police devrait également être obligée d'enregistrer tous ces contrôles, ainsi que de donner une copie de ces informations aux personnes qu'elle arrête. Ces données devraient également être rendues publiques et il devrait être obligatoire pour les États membres d'enquêter sur tous les décès en garde à vue et de garantir la responsabilité et les sanctions appropriées pour tous les agents qui font un usage illégal de la force. Nous devons donc, dans ce sens, veiller à ce que la justice, selon l'origine ethnique, soit intégrée dans tous les domaines, numérique, emploi, climat, politique sociale, de la même manière que pour le genre. Nous pouvons également parler d'intersectionnalité, mais il est important pour nous de faire référence à l'égalité selon le groupe ethnique. Car on oublie souvent que l'intersectionnalité a été inventée pour parler des multiples discriminations auxquelles sont confrontées les femmes noires. En outre, notre préoccupation pour la vie des personnes d'origine africaine, noire, ne doit pas se limiter aux détenteurs de passeports européens. Il est absolument nécessaire que l'Union européenne se dote d'une politique migratoire humaine qui ne contribue pas aux inconvénients structurels que connaissent les groupes ethniques en Europe. Cela nécessite donc une réévaluation de l'approche de l'Union européenne en, manière, en matière d'immigration illégale, une catégorie et une pratique qui a causé malheureusement la mort de milliers de personnes en Méditerranée, ce qui déclenche la violence et aussi le contrôle selon le faciès qui justifie la discrimination structurelle dans les États membres de l'Union européenne en termes d'accès à l'emploi, au logement, aux soins de santé, à l'aide aux victimes de violences domestiques et bien plus encore. J'espère vraiment que cette prise de conscience de la question du racisme n'est pas un simple feu de paille et que des mesures politiques concrètes et des financements seront mis en place pour lutter contre le racisme et la discrimination dans l'Union européenne. Le Covid-19 a exacerbé des problèmes qui ont longtemps été sous-jacents dans nos sociétés. Il est grand temps que nous nous efforcions d'inverser la, la tendance 
et de garantir l'égalité pour tous. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Merci à vous. Merci à vous, madame. Aussi pour souligner l'importance de l'intersectionnalité dans ce domaine-là, qui est crucial euh, quand on essaie de comprendre les phénomènes euh, et appliquer cette notion euh, dans notre analyse. Aussi, les points que vous avez faits par rapport à la violence policière, la, que c'est clé euh, d'avoir euh, un, un système de, de, de responsabilité, des sanctions, de, euh, vraiment des « accountability » en anglais, euh, de notre force policière. Euh, aussi, quand il y a des cas de l'usage illégal, comme vous avez parlé de la force, euh, que ça arrive, ça arrive, et euh, euh, donc on doit euh, un intérêt pour tout le monde, un intérêt pour tout le monde d'avoir des procédures très claires euh, et légitimes, comme vous avez fait euh, référence, et euh, les points euh, aussi très importants qui est lié euh, aussi à, il y a eu une question d'un participant euh, qui est liée à votre point de la politique migratoire. Alors, la question de l'action plan qui a mentionné la commissaire Dali, euh, la nécessité d'inclure euh, les migrants et les réfugiés, réfugiés, la protection des réfugiés des, des immigrants aussi dans cette action plan. Donc, merci beaucoup pour votre intervention. Alors, next, uh, uh, we have the presentation by NR, representing NR. NR has been already mentioned several times because of its fantastic role in mobilizing uh, for a long time, mobilizing and acting in those issues, making reference to these issues at European Union level. And we have the pleasure to have with us Karen Taylor. Karen, you have the floor. Thank you very much for having me and for inviting Ina and me as chair of the European Network Against Racism to speak at this occasion. Um, there have been several occasions lately in the past where our organization, others um, from the civil society have been involved. And I want to say, we do appreciate um, reaching out to us because in the former past before this um yeah recent spike of protests um even though we demanded uh, to to take actions together apart from the fra the fra has been very different when it comes to that but um, um other parts from from the commission but also from uh, the european parliament haven't reached out to us so we do appreciate that there's a new movement here and that uh, there's a real necessity to actually work with the groups which are concerned. Because, um, and my predecessors have already um, said that when we look at the problem, which we do all name structural racism, it's not a new one. It's not new since COVID, it's not new since the protests which have been ongoing on the streets, but we see what happens if we don't tackle it and if we don't speak about it. I mean, um, you yourself, um, Dr. Piret, Helsberger, Fofana, you have been victim to structural racism, to police violence in the streets of Brussels, holding your, 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 um, your, your membership uh, uh, um, card of the parliament itself. So we do see it does affect black and brown people on their daily life and and the extent of that is that people die at the hands um, of, of police violence so here we do need to address the problem which is at the core we do need to look at the past and the historically rooted um, past of abuses and oppressions of racialized groups in Europe, we do we do talk about policies, but we do also need a, a change in in the whole discussion we are having and a new awareness rising, and that is it is covered from education uh, over policies, but also over the speech of representatives from the European institutions. And I here want to name Ina address this publicly in an open letter that it's absolutely. Uh, shameful, I must say, for the European institutions. And here I have to name uh, one vice president of the commission itself who openly denied the existence of structural racism and said, well, um, uh, uh, the, the, the issue of police violence, or there is no issue of police violence in Europe. And if we look at the deaths um, 
in Europe, it's not as bad as in the US, then I must ask, well, when is it bad enough to actually address it? Isn't one person who dies at the end of, pol of police violence, isn't that enough? Um, so we do need to look at the institutional practices. We do need to look at policies, cultural representations and norms, legacy of histor historical oppressions, um, which lead to racial inequality. So linked to COVID-19, and Ina has also shown that um, um, via a map, which is available on our website, a map where we highlighted um, cases of discrimination which were linked to COVID-19, and it is spread throughout um, um, the employment sector, the housing sector, of course, racial profiling and police brutality, where we even had two deaths out uh, of that are a huge issue here. Um, but we also talk about racist violence and speech, which we um, monitor during that period from different member states, as well as the denial of access to healthcare system and the denial of access to basic services, uh, water, electricity, and so on. And of course, here one must say that the, the group which was mostly um, impacted by, by these measures were migrant communities, non-documented communities, and of course the refugees, which are still um, 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 kept in, in, in camps where the, 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 the situation is, is um, always there for a COVID-19 outbreak. So here we do need to look at these, these people who are encaptured in these kinds of situations and need to make sure that um, basic services are provided for the most vulnerable of us because who are we within the European Union? If we say we fight for human rights for everybody, how come that we exclude a huge part of our population? So when we look at um, um, tackling um, structural racism, it is absolutely necessary to have an accurate picture of what is happening. And that's what I try to, 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 to highlight here. I, I get a bit emotional when I talk about these issues. Um, so we need to show the systemic discrimination of some groups in some areas, which we did try to highlight in our map. And we need to be able to prove when non-discrimination legislation is constantly not applied. And then I do appreciate that Commissioner Daly here also talked about sanctioning member states whenever that happens. And uh, we need to be able to show some policies that, are ne that have a negative impact on racialized groups and um, contributing to more racial inequalities. And here I also look at the at the new fund which should come up linked to COVID-19 here it's absolutely necessary to address these vulnerable groups I just mentioned. And when we talk about um, in, um, to improving fundamental rights monitoring which um, here directly would be the task again linked to COVID-19, it is um, uh, crucial that we prioritize the research on the impact of COVID-19 um, because for now, if I look at certain member states, there are no, there's no data connected to, no race aggregated data connected to the impact of COVID-19. Um, in Germany, for example, uh, it's complete. Th th this question doesn't even come up because um, there's no um, 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 awareness of of the of the high impact uh, which COVID nineteen has on the racialized groups. So it's absolutely crucial that here the FRA steps in, and I, I know you've been doing it in the past um, with 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 specific reports um, that the already mentioned report. On, on Black lives in Europe. Um, so it, it would be crucial to hear again, go into, into detail what COVID-19 actually did to our minority groups and also um, the policies which follow up on, on um, dealing with the situation. Is there a mainstreaming of um, anti-racist politics and is there a mainstreaming of making sure that the most marginalized groups are touched by these um, improvements, which which should be ha which should happen out of these um, out of these policies. Um, then, of course, 
um, we, um, member states should be obliged in general um, to collect equality data disaggregated by race. It, that should be, um, which is grounded then on, a, on European Commission guidelines based on key principles such as self-identification, anonymity, vulnerability basis. And here also Ina has made uh, um, several reports based on these on these principles, which could also um, serve as as yeah as a resource or or inspiration. We need to have more research looking at sociological explanations of the over and under representation of certain groups in specific sectors to uncover the structural and historical and systemic factors. So here. Um, we do also need to turn inwards the um, European institutions, but also externally in the labor market to see if we talk about vulnerable groups on the labor market, why is that so? And which groups are the most, uh, most affected ones in order to come up with targeted measures? Because that I think is, is what is missing. And that's because of the lack of data in this in this field. Um, and here again, uh, to mention police violence, there's more research needs to be done on the impact of policing on, on racialized groups and where it comes from, because having this, this um, rhetoric that um, mi migrant communities or minoritized communities need to be policed more because that's where the crime happens. There's already an, an, a fault in the setting of these kind of uh, algorithms because if I go into the migrant communities more often than I go into white communities, well, the result will be that there is more crime in, in the migrant communities. So uh, we really need to look at the, at, the, at, the, at the core of why and how policing happens and that also applies in general and um, to all kinds of um, algorithms which have been used, especially also um, when it comes to um, um, uh, intelligence. Um, uh, um, I'm lacking the word here, but I think you know what I mean. Um, it's not digital intelligence, but you know what I mean. Okay, moving on. Um, the last two points I would like to mention is that we need to have a systemic fundamental rights assessment of policies to ensure racial equality and justice outcomes. We need to learn from the work on indicators framework on Roma inclusion, for example, and equality to be applied to all policies and racialized groups. And of course, and I already mentioned that at the beginning, we need to establish a closer and permanent consultative structure with civil society on, also on the collection of data and this disaggregated by race because it can't be enough to only call us when the house is already burning. Um, we need to be there so it doesn't burn down. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Karen, for for your presentation and also your drive and your energy that you bring into these debates. Um, and you've highlighted several very important issues, uh, the work of NR, and um, also underline some uh, very fundamental questions that will be coming back to them during the Q&A uh, uh, time that we will have after the next presentation. But I just wanted to thank you and also NR just published also a roadmap for EU institutions to address structural racism, which um, again towards this racial equality, racial equality and justice that Karen uh, has been uh, so eloquently presenting. Uh, so really big thanks. Uh, and before the Q&A, I wanted to give the floor to Dora Kostakopoulou, who has been patiently waiting. And uh, she is one of the key leading experts in Europe uh, in these questions. We look forward to hearing your views, Dora. You, you need to unmute yourself. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much, Sergio and the SEPS team, Commissioner Dali and fellow co-panelists for this wonderful opportunity to share the discussion with you. This is a very, very timely and important initiative, Sergio. And I learned a lot from the presentations 
of my fellow co-panelists. And I would like to welcome the wonderful news that the new action plan will be announced in September 2020, and also the emphasis on the enforcement of the legal instruments you already have. I think um, Michael noted how important the correct transposition of the directive is, but also of the implementation of the charter articles. It has taken so many years for the charter articles to become a reality in our everyday lives. And it has taken also a number of years for national judiciaries to feel comfortable to use these articles in order to address individual and systemic inequalities that exist. So my short presentation will focus on three brief points, a little bit about the past, the present and the future. And I'll start with a rather pessimistic note and I hope your team and our attendees will forgive me for that. We are in 2020. And yet 35 years ago, before the European Union became the European Union, at that time it was the European community, the European Parliament established a pioneering committee. And that was the committee of inquiry into the rise of racism and fascism in Europe. This took place in 1984-85. In, in so the Treaty on European Union did not exist at that time. And they worked for months and months and months and they produced a wonderful report, the so-called Evrigenis Report, which documented a deepening problem in Europe at that time. And it also made a number of recommendations. Now, if I recollect, the report, it contained more than 40 recommendations at that time. Recommendations in order to tackle racism, anti-Semitism, rising xenophobia and fascism in Europe. And these recommendations focused on four levels. The institutional level was tackled first. And by institutional level, we are not merely referring to law, we are also referring to policies, procedures, and practices in various institutions. Then the second level was the information level and the role of mass media, but also the importance of official discourses about issues, about individuals, about groups, and the role of these discourses play in socializing people. And by saying socializing, I'll use another term, humanizing people in a sense. The third level was education, and I think it was mentioned in the question addressed to Commissioner Dali. And the final was the level of social forces or civil society, a vibrant civil society, which highlights important issues such as racism and structural discrimination and victimization. So 40 recommendations were made at that time, and I think in 1986, we had the adoption of a joint declaration against racism and xenophobia. Now, this declaration was signed by the Council, the Commission, and the European Parliament. So this was a very important initiative in the 1980s, designed to tackle racism and anti-Semitism and xenophobia in Europe. And all three institutions committed themselves to the eradication of this phenomenon. Zero tolerance, Europe should display zero tolerance to racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Gypsism, and so on and so forth. From a sociological point of view, the report was rather limited because it highlighted um, two main causes of racism. The first one was the rise of reactionary nationalism. And the second one was the trend towards individualization in changing European industrial societies. I don't believe, and I could be incorrect on this, that it highlighted issues concerning colonization and the slave trade. But the work, the work began in the 1990s to 
put some flesh onto the bones of this initiative. And of course, the European Union obtained more competencies, and then we had the Amsterdam reforms. And finally, finally, the proclamation of the Charter in 2000 at the Nice European Council. Now, this is the European Union's Bill of Rights, and it's one of the most important instruments that the European Union has in tackling racism, discrimination, xenophobia, and prejudice. This charter, our charter, has the most powerful article of all, Article 1, an article that the European Convention on Human Rights does not have, the article on human dignity. And it says that human dignity is inviolable. It must be respected and protected. Now, this is an absolute right. This right does not permit any limitations. And the terms that the drafts have chose are also important. They say that human dignity must be respected by all. Human dignity for all, not for citizens, but for all, not for residents, for all but also protected. Now, the term protected implies a positive duty, positive obligations on the part of all institutions to make this article a concrete reality in the lives, societies, cultures, and discourses throughout Europe. It also implies the need for positive actions. Without the affirmation and protection of human dignity, life itself loses its meaning. Human beings get suffocated. They cannot really breathe. And this is the message that comes out of the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and for us, this is the birth of a new consciousness. This is, this, is, this is a new consciousness that is emerging. And the need for change whilst the pandemic is unfolding. And this is something that must be recognized. And that's why Michael was absolutely correct to identify the need for engaging, listening to, and co-designing instruments, policies, initiatives with the participants. So a powerful call has been made for democracies to defend their own values. for societies to defend their own values and to affirm human life and equal human dignity. And whilst I agree with all our companies and the work that you have been doing as SEPs that we need to condemn all these ugly manifestations of hate, oppression and division during the pandemic, we must also acknowledge that the glass is also half full because we have seen the worst and the best of humanity. We have seen manifestations of humanism, kindness, self-sacrifice, compassion displayed by millions during this crisis. So the pandemic in a sense, in addition to the birth of new consciousness, gives us space and an opportunity to rethink and to rehumanize ourselves, to relearn those important values of care, empathy, and kindness for one another. So my note about the future is, and this is, this is a rather optimistic one, unlike the beginning of the presentation, which is rather pessimistic, that one could only hope that this unprecedented calamity is also a breakthrough, that it is a beginning for a new awareness and a more people-centered world which celebrates the sanctity of human life and values and protects equal human dignity. Thank you for the attention. Wow, very strong message, uh, Dora, um, about this uh, new consciousness that you mentioned, um, that we are seeing so clearly across the globe. You know, the um, 
how this new consciousness is emerging and manifest and taking shapes in people, taking their own action and mobilizing and uh, as an expression of democracy and the values that uh, are at the foundations of our uh, societies. And thank you also for uh, making the link with Michael's point of engaging those who mobilize and in the co-design uh, of uh, policies um, through active participation and also bringing light on human dignity um, in, in Article 1 of the Charter and the significance of the EU Charter. Actually, I agree fully with you. Sometimes I, I'm surprised one of the most important achievements of the EU, having a legally binding EU Charter of Fundamental Rights that is so less spoken in political, sometimes in the highest political instances, when it makes a difference, you know, of showing value of Europe for people, is the charter, is the EU charter, everything, everything is there. Um, so thank you for, uh, um, you know, highlighting that and um, coming back to the role of fundamental rights um, in the scope of the charter and the role of the EU. Now we have compiled a number of questions and some of you also make reference to each other. I wanted to give you, know, give you back the possibility uh, to respond to some of those, starting with Michael. Uh, Michael, um, um, there, were, there was one question and also Karen's, Karen's contribution, um, highlighting or also um, raising the question as to the what's uh, coming in terms of the fraud work um, on racialized groups and minority groups um, what else can we, uh, let's say, expect of FRA uh, engaging more in this area and research? And also one participant asks very specifically, if uh, under the current, uh, what else could we do in terms of could the FRA do in the current mandate when it comes to monitoring equality, for example, or um, specifically questions of equality? Also, if you would like to comment on any of the points raised, as your chance. Thank you very much, Sergio. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't not comment about the charter, could I? Uh, it, maybe in retrospect, it's embarrassing that I didn't mention it. Um, promoting the use of the charter is again, a really important area of work for the agency. And um, uh, it's getting better. Uh, maybe that's a, a good point to make that we are, we're, we're, we're looking in year by year, we publish an analysis every year, and we are seeing a rise in its reference, particularly it's notably improved in the EU institutions. Uh, the main problem now is at the national level. And there it's not, a, it's not always about a resistance, it's about a, a lack of knowledge and confusion about wh when the charter applies and doesn't apply. So we have to all stay very invested in building up the culture of charter and charter rights at the national level. And maybe SEPs might look at organizing something around that topic. Uh, we'll be very happy to help you. Um, the, um, now back to your questions. As I said, uh, when I spoke originally, we're, we're committed at our core uh, to st stay working on the combat of racism and discrimination. Uh, that's, that's reflected uh, for instance, maybe above all, in our repeated surveys of the experience of minorities. Uh, we've already rolled these out twice. They, they, they were formerly known as EU Midas. That was just the technical term for the surveys. They will continue, albeit they'll, um, they won't be rolled out as a single blockbuster every fifth year, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll feed the evidence into the policy cycle. So the evidence with regard to the situation of Roma will appear when it's, it's, it's best situated for the policy, EU policy cycle and so on for the different minority groups. So we will, we will stay very committed to this work and we'll continue to provide the, 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 uh, the evidence which can be um, analyzed over time uh, that uh, people find so useful. Um, now, I saw the question that was put about uh, our mandate and gathering equality data. There's no problem there. The mandate is fine on that particular topic. Uh, it's, it's, um, we, we, we have, uh, do and will continue to gather equality data without impediments. Um, what's more, we're, we're invested in supporting the EU member states to do a better job themselves uh, of uh, gathering uh, equality data. And um, we're very active in a number of countries uh, uh, on the ground uh, providing the sort of capacity building supports for that. So there, there, we, we, we have mandate issues, but this isn't one of them. Thanks a lot. 
thanks a lot. Um, following on this equality data um, uh, conversation, I was wondering because this was also mentioned by Karen in her presentation and by Dr. Herzberger also in her presentation about the need to collect more data, more statistical data. And I was wondering, and this is a question for both uh, Karen and uh, Pierrette, um, what about, uh, of course, one can agree that we need to know best what is going on. Um, is there any risk of uh, potential misuses of this data, uh, particularly in contexts where we may have institutionalized um, discrimination or racism? Are, how can we go about uh, addressing risks of misuses? Uh, could we uh, foresee, for example, focusing on service provision? having more statistics on inequality when it comes to service provision in terms of different grounds, um, depending on the ethnicity or, you know, or, or, or racial origin. And then also, um, similarly, perhaps also here, Michael, you may, you may also help. Um, there's, been, um, um, there's been this um, comment on learning from the EU Roma integration uh, framework and the national strategies. Um, how, what do you think in terms of what can we draw? What, what can we draw in terms of lessons learned from that experience when looking at wider uh, racism and discrimination um, issues? And particularly because if I remember correctly, that framework does not uh, formally uh, or clearly include, for example, questions on police or uh, institutionalized um, questions of discrimination and anti gypsyism um, uh, If you have any comments on this, that would be great. Um, so, uh, Karen, would you like to comment on this point? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, Audi, the first question, um, service provision uh, data, or, or data on service provision, versus maybe equality data, I think we need both. And of course, when we look at equality data, there is, um, uh, yeah, there's a, a valuable concern when it comes to misusing these kinds of data, uh, also linked to, to the history of Europe. So I do understand that there is this um, fear of, of of, of misusing the data. And that's why um, and Dr. Pirat Hetzberger Fofana mentioned it. Um, the, my organization here in Germany, each one teach one, which is conducting this Afro census, which is the first survey um, uh, on black people in, in, in Germany, covering this, this um, wide range to know about the realities, the, the, the amount of discrimination, but also the contribution of the black population here in Germany. And I think it's crucial that whenever these kind of data are collected, and um, th there is a co-work and there is um, a coalition between civil society and the state actor. And in our case, for example, it's even us as organization keeping and, and, and having this data on our private servers. So trust can be built whenever you work with the communities which are, which are touched then by this collection of data. So I think that's absolutely crucial. And then of course, we need to um, um, respect the guidelines, anonymity, um, that's completely uh, free to give in this, this data and self-identification. So I think that's crucial. Of course, we do need to service provision. Um, the service provision is uh, this kind of data, that's what we call for, which need to be collected by the member states itself. And because for now there's been a high blindness on when it comes to unequal um, provision of services. So I do think we need to have, have this both. And then, sorry, the second question was? The second question related to the Roma strategy. It was mentioned uh, by Commissioner Dali that we can draw uh, lessons learned from uh, the EU national integration of Roma framework. Uh, if you had any comments on that. Mm -hmm. So talking to the Roma and city community on a European level, but also here in my, in my country and on German level, I know that the issue about this framework is that it addressed Roma as an issue. 
that, that it ad addressed it from the side from the ones which are actually uh, called victims of anti ciganism So we do need to change this narrative and, 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 and look into main, mainstream society and where does the exclusion actually happen. So that is something which I take from this framework, but I do acknowledge the fact that for the very first time there was um, said highlight to this issue and that this issue was actually named and put in a framework. So that's what some, something I absolutely appreciate. And what I do think we need to um, transfer onto other minoritized and marginalized groups, because whenever we um, handpick one of these groups, we actually, um, make the other groups invisible. And I don't think that's something which we do want um, as the European Union or uh, institutions from so on. So um, whenever we come up with a new framework, I believe a complete umbrella framework, but mentioning the specific kinds of racism targeted to the different groups could be a solution here. And I really hope that this, um, action plan against um, racism called out by the by the European Commission will be something that had, has a holistic approach because also uh, looking at the different intersections, um, gender, class, race, but also um, sexual identity and so on. Um, these kinds of questions are not integrated whenever we only take a single group or the, the solo um, um, uh, approach. So that, that's what I would take from that. Thanks a lot. Dr. Herzberger, vous avez la parole? Vous voulez votre microphone, il faut le désactiver. Merci. Alors, on se soulève souvent à cette question-là en disant que euh, cela peut être contraire à ce que l'on veut. Or, l'exemple du Royaume-Uni a prouvé qu'avec les données que l'on a eues, on a pu savoir, par exemple, que la population noire, noire, black, people of color, tout ce qu'on veut, est la population qui a été la plus touchée, par exemple, lors du Covid. C'est parce qu'on a eu des données exactes. En ayant aussi ces données-là, on peut euh, changer, d'abord, on a, on, a on, on a des données exactes, on sait qui est touché, on peut prouver ce qui, en, ce qui, en ce qui concerne la violence policière, hein, et surtout, euh, la commission elle-même a aussi produit des guides en donnant, euh, en donnant euh, des chiffres et en montrant que, quels que soient les groupes qui que l'on prend, on voit les différences parmi aussi ces différents groupes. Et moi, je suis aussi d'avis, comme a dit Karine, qu'on ne peut pas prendre un seul groupe, le mettre en évidence et oublier tous les autres groupes. Et on ne peut pas non plus reporter sur les autres groupes ce qui se passe sur un. Par exemple, la violence policière est beaucoup plus forte chez des jeunes d'origine maghrébine, d'origine africaine, que peut-être même chez des Roms. Ça, c'est une, ce sont selon les données que l'on a eues. Et donc, il s'agit surtout... Euh, maintenant, de savoir quelles sont aussi, peut-être une chose que l'on oublie, les aspirations de ces groupes-là. Parce qu'on ne connaît pas les aspirations de la jeunesse euh, noire, africaine, d'origine africaine, maghrébine et tout ça, parce qu'elle est stigmatisée, elle est tellement stigmatisée que l'on n'arrive même pas à s'imaginer qu'elle ait envie de changer, qu'elle a des aspirations et qu'elle a aussi un apport positif pour l'Union européenne. Et je crois que ça, c'est aussi très important de voir ce côté-là. Voilà, je pense que c'est un peu ce que je voulais vous dire. Et peut-être que je vais ajouter, je trouve justement euh, en Allemagne, surtout pour l'Allemagne, on n'a on a pas de données. Parce que pendant très longtemps, l'Allemagne a refusé ces données-là. Bon, c'est un peu avec, à cause du passé historique, que le passé historique a joué à un tel poids que dès qu'on parle de données... Tout le monde ferme les yeux, c'est comme si vous aviez des œillères, hein, on ferme les yeux, non, 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 pas de données, mais le passé historique n'a rien à voir avec ce qui se passe actuellement. Et c'est cela que l'on doit faire si l'on veut absolument avoir, comme on dit, si on ne veut laisser personne en rade, « so not let nobody behind hein, », c'est toujours ça, « we don't left anybody behind ». On est en train de laisser tomber toute la jeunesse 
toute cette jeunesse euh, noire, euh, brown people, maghrébine, et toute cette jeunesse-là qui forme en fait l'Europe. Et ça, c'est un point, très, enfin, à mon avis, primordial. Et c'est aussi la raison pour laquelle nous avons besoin de ces dates-là. Et moi, j'apprécie beaucoup de savoir que bientôt, et Otto va faire cette, euh, cette enquête et que l'on va enfin avoir ces fameuses données. Enfin, on pourra dire oui, c'est vrai, euh, l'omniprésence de la police, euh, l'omniprésence de enfin, des forces policières fait aussi ces réactions parfois. Et ça, ce sont des choses que l'on peut avoir, que l'on ne saura que si on en a des dates. Et, parce que les, les jeunes, tous ces jeunes-là, bon, les jeunes ou les moins jeunes, moi je ne suis pas jeune quand même. Hein <rire> Parce que les jeunes et les moins jeunes sont tout de suite euh, pratiquement agressés aussi. Et tout de suite, on suppose que parce que, à cause de la couleur de la peau, euh, et ce sont des criminels en puissance. C'est ce que l'on voit partout. Et c'est ça que, surtout que ces dates-là vont nous donner, justement à partir du moment où on aura, euh, lorsque la police va, 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 enfin, va, euh, regard, va arrêter quelqu'un, quel, les motifs. Et moi, je pense que peut-être il y a un exemple qui serait aussi intéressant, c'est celui du Danemark. Là, euh, je me suis renseignée un peu et de voir qu'au Danemark, il y a une... C'est un autre groupe qui enquête et qui vérifie toutes ces données-là. Ce qui fait que ce n'est pas, pas toujours la police elle-même qui fait tout le travail, mais aussi un autre groupe qui est plus impartial, surtout, un groupe qui est impartial, qui n'a rien à voir. Et à ce moment-là, il me semble qu'on pourrait avancer, de, aller de l'avant sans avoir ni à stigmatiser la police, ni à stigmatiser les jeunes, et enfin se retrouver ensemble et trouver comment réussir à bâtir une société où il n'y aura plus de peur ni d'un côté ni de l'autre. Parce qu'en fait, c'est ça que l'on veut faire. C'est ce qu'on a dit lorsqu'on a dit on veut bâtir une nouvelle Europe, une, une Europe où tous seront ensemble. Et pour cela, il faut qu'on trouve une solution. Comment arriver à s'entendre, comment arriver à dialoguer ensemble. I suppose you can sum up what I have said. <rire> Très clair, merci beaucoup pour souligner la, les rôles de la, aussi de l'importance de l'impartialité, l'indépendance et euh, l'usage de cette euh, information pour montrer ce qui se passe, euh, les pratiques, pour documenter les pratiques euh, discriminatoires. Uh, I'm sure that on this question of data, Michael may want to develop as well. Michael. Sure, sure. yes, thank you. Um, we at the Fundamental Rights Agency are absolutely clear that we've got to get disaggregated data. Now, we're well aware of the concerns, the historical legacies, and the reasons for resistance from some governments and some communities to the gathering of data disaggregated, for example, by ethnicity. Um, we have to be very respectful of the origins of the concerns. But nevertheless, we've reached a point where we can still preserve anonymity, where we can ensure that, the, in fact, the GDPR protections go a very long way to reassure with regard to the use of data. Uh, but if we, well, we, we, we just, we, if we, we can't fix, if we can't measure, it's as simple as that. A very, uh, one other very important dimension uh, is in line with international human rights law. Uh, the et ethnic or racial identity must be based on the principle of self-identification. Uh, it must be the, uh, the, the, the individuated choice of the human to, to, to designate to what, uh, 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 his or her ethnic identity. Um, that, by the way, brings me to answer the question you put to me a, a little time back there on what we can learn from the experience working with Roma. And this indeed is the first lesson. Uh, the second lesson is that um, we um, very closely related uh, to the gathering of data is the design of smart progress indicators. Uh, it, this has been a, a tough lesson to learn in the Roma context, and it's as important in the combat of racism more broadly. Uh, and uh, uh, and it, I, I won't say anything more about data, but it's not much point in having indicators if you can't populate them with the necessary data. What else have we learned? Uh, we've learned uh, that um, participation of the impacted community is critical. Again, it's the point I made earlier and was made by others as well. It's not, not about doing things for people, it's about working with people. And we, but we've had to learn that because it's repeatedly, and to this day, I still see an unwillingness to involve rights holders uh, in, 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 in work that's for their benefit. 
very closely related to the participation principle is the need to go local. Um, one size fits all doesn't work. Uh, and we have to be willing to have complicated, very localized, diverse approaches, depending uh, on the particular um, issues in this or that community, this or that village. Uh, it makes it much more complicated, but much more effective. And we know that from our qualitative research uh, across Europe, as well as from a more direct experience uh, with, with the uh, EU strategies. Um, two last points. Um, Again, they've been made repeatedly today, but they're no less important for me to mention again. Uh, first of them is that we cannot decouple patterns of hate from patterns of discrimination. Uh, to, for either to be successfully tackled, both must be addressed. I gave the example of how you, you cannot work on discrimination against Roma without working also on anti-gypsyism. And the point can be rolled out much more broadly. And finally, um, We've learned from the Roma context, uh, as well as uh, otherwise, uh, that the full focus of attention shouldn't be exclusively on the impacted community. It's got to be on the general population. The acts of hatred, the acts of racism, the acts of discrimination are perpetrated against people and communities. And so we must, we must work, if you will, with perpetrators, uh, our whole societies. And so we have to invest in rooting out prejudice uh, and hatred, and indeed, where it crosses the criminal law line, uh, holding people accountable uh, in, in the criminal courts. So these are all lessons from um, from the Roma context and more broadly, uh, but the, but they do make for smart, impactful uh, efforts. Thank you, Michael. Laura, would you like to provide any final comment? Thank you. Hitting me, I think, yes. Sergio, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Something that emerges from the history of the European Union itself. When the principle of non-discrimination on the ground of nationality was established, the European Union or the European community at the time never saw it as a problem situated within specific groups, i.e. the movers, the EU citizens, or EU nationals crossing borders. They acknowledge that the problem lies with member states and host societies. Hence the emphasis since 1957 on the principle of equal treatment, because by treating people equally, by letting them in essentially, you make them feel part of your public. Now, this is a very, very important lesson right now with respect to racism and xenophobia and anti-Semitism. The problem is not a group-specific problem. It's a problem of European societies, of the European Union itself, that has to be tackled at that level. So it's a question essentially of the values on which European societies and countries and constitutional democracies and the European Union itself have been based. And I think this is, this is, this is the lesson that emerges from the culture of establishing the principle of non-discrimination on the ground of nationality, which was not an easy one to establish throughout Europe, bearing in mind the Second World War and the energy that existed. And yet it was established as a result of systematic and concerted actions by a various means. And this is something that has to happen now. We have to recognize that this is Europe's problem. This is state's problem. This is society's problem. It's not a problem that is situated within specific groups in society. Thank you, Laura. Wow, I would love to continue uh, speaking and exchanging with all of you. Um, the time is um, up at the moment, but um, you know it's been fascinating um, how you know we bring this consciousness at this very moment, and consciousness that consciousness as a motor of change uh, that we need to see that change for everyone, and uh, this has this has come quite clearly out of your discussions, 
working with people, as Michael was saying, as also Dr. Herzberger, uh, engaging those voices. Um, Karen was saying, making those visible um, as indeed part of our societies and addressing that. Um, in terms of monitoring, you've all underlined the importance of multiplicity of actors uh, joining forces in that monitoring. So we've seen the role of civil society, we've seen the role of human rights bodies, we've seen the role of EU agencies and uh, European institutions, but also academics and research centers like, like CEPS uh, in providing independent analysis and, and evidence to, to illustrate also um, those uh, developments and monitoring uh, human rights and rule of law uh, violations. So I've learned a big deal out of this exchange. This is the fourth, I think, webinar we organized on COVID-19 topics related to freedom, security, and justice policies in the EU. And I'm very grateful um, to the FRA for trusting uh, us and joining forces in this uh, event. Uh, me too, I hope this will not be the last, it's just be the first opportunity of first experience, there will be uh, uh, more. And to all of you, uh, panelists, um, uh, thank you for joining us today. We've managed well between English and French. Uh, I hope uh, you, know, you all have been able, also the participants, uh, able to follow um, this fascinating conversation. So on behalf of SEPS, thanks. Um, have a wonderful afternoon and um, see you soon. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mais j'ai dit, j'ai fait bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>